Hello everybody, uh, welcome back to Moss on a Monday for May. Now you know the drill by now, each month I do two fiction and two non-fiction. They're books that I love or I've got down from my shelves or have just been pressed into my hands. The idea is simply to celebrate fantastic books and hopefully that you will enjoy them too. So I'm going to dive straight in and this is the first one. It is a novel called Peter Abelard by the Ulster Scots writer Helen Waddell. And when it came out in 1933, it was the book of the year, a massive bestseller. Um, it's why I started writing historical fiction, really. Um, it's the story of uh, Eloise and Abelard, which you might know from the Pope poem or from many other um, examples of this particular medieval love story, which captured all of Europe and has continued to capture all of the world, really, since then. The unrequited love story of uh, two lovers, Peter Abelard, who was a medieval monk, um, and his pupil Eloise, who became Eloise de D'Argentoy, who became one of the great religious women of the 12th century. And of course, you know, one could say she's <laughs> his student and he was the tutor. They shouldn't have been together in the first place. But when it was discovered, um, he was treated extremely badly and so was she and she was sent off to a nunnery. But for the rest of their lives, they wrote letters to each other. So the love story is not really about the beginning and the terrible moment when they're discovered and when it's all going to be catastrophic and Abelard nearly dies, but it's more about the way that they wrote to each other for the whole of the rest of their lives. And she was, Eloise, um, a great scholar of the medieval period. Uh, her letters about faith, about the world, about the nature of things, and she rose to become an abbess, the paraclete, um, you know, up in northern France. They are the staple of what was later to become courtly love. The idea that love was, if you like, purer and more real and more important and more long-lasting if it existed if you like, on the page and in the mind and in songs, you know, all the troubadours and the trouvères down in, in Carcassonne. Now, I read this when I was at school and I was told about this uh, by a tutor um, who was telling the story of Eloise and Abelard. And because I read this novel, years later, I realised that it was possible to make historical fiction live and out of the moment and to understand that characters from the very distant past were the same as us in many ways, in terms of how their hearts worked, how their hearts broke. And the other reason that I love this novel um, and why it's so special to me, it's the only novel she wrote. Helen Waddell was born in Tokyo in 1899. She was a scholar, she was a translator, she spoke Greek and Latin, Chinese, Japanese. And this was her one, if you like, her one piece of triviality, not that it, it was at all, but her one novel was this. I. I'm rather obsessed with Helen Waddell because she was a superstar in her time. And she's one of the women that I write about in my book, Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolutionaries. Because despite being this extraordinary towering figure of the 20th century, she has completely disappeared. She's represented in Writer's Square in Belfast, where all the names of some of the great writers of Northern Ireland are etched on the ground. But most people, as they walk through that extraordinary square, we, Queen Square will not even know her name, let alone know that her name is there. And it got me thinking in a way about how easily women disappear from the historical record and how easily Helen Waddell, who didn't marry, didn't have children, so doesn't have somebody protecting her legacy in quite the same sort of way, um, has vanished from the public view. This is one of the great novels of the 20th century and should be on every bookshelf. It's out of print. I made a a small documentary for the BBC, BBC Northern Ireland, about Helen Waddell, and as a result, it's now in print as an e-book, and I'll put the details on um, on the channel. But all I want to say is, please try and get hold of a copy, read it, and then post on social media saying, why has this woman been forgotten when so many other probably mediocre writers have been remembered? So it is Peter Abelard by Helen Waddell, 1933 classic. Now, my first non-fiction uh, for May also, in a way, comes out of the book uh, Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolutionaries, which I've been writing over the last 18 months. And it is this. It is a beautiful book by Frances Wilson called The Ballad of Dorothy Wordsworth. 
and it is kind of a memoir um, about Dorothy Wordsworth, but it's also about the way in which Dorothy Wordsworth, as a woman and as a writer, and I suppose as a muse, has been presented in non-fiction and biographies, particularly of her brother William Wordsworth, for many, many centuries now. So the bare bones of the story are this, that Dorothy and William Wordsworth were very close as siblings. There were other siblings, in, in particularly um, the older brother John, but for a while Dorothy Wordsworth and William Wordsworth lived together. Many of you will have visited the cottage in Grasmere, Dove Cottage, but they also were together for much of their lives and down in Alt Foxton in Somerset. And Dorothy Wordsworth didn't write for publication, but she wrote two journals, the Grasmere Journals and the Alt Foxton Journals. And I was given this book, not this, this version obviously, but the Wordsworth Journals by my grandmother when we were going to the Lake District in the 1970s for a family holiday and a place called Stair Mill, which was near Grasmere, uh, Newlands Valley. And it was a place that was very dear to my father and very dear to my grandmother. And the heart of my non-fiction book is walking in the footsteps of my great-grandmother, Lily Watson, who was the person who first took everybody to the Lake District. And when we were going there, my grandmother gave me a copy of Dorothy Wordsworth's journals. And I fell in love with her writing. She is one of the great nature writers of the 19th century. Uh, she was obviously born at the end of the 18th century. And this book, The Ballad of Dorothy Wordsworth, if you like, animates this very unusual, very exceptional woman. She's so often presented only in relation to her, her brother William, who of course was one of the great romantic poets and an incredibly important figure of the Enlightenment. But it is, it's not stretching to say that without Dorothy, many of his best lines, not least the famous daffodils, would not have happened. They worked together, they walked together, they were extremely um, symbiotically linked, not just to each other and to their environment, but to the landscape through the, which they walked. Dorothy was one of those very unusual women. She decided not to marry, she didn't want to marry. Everybody talks about her as being very distinctive, very small and very, you know, full of energy. And you will find it in Coleridge as well when he talks about Christabel's wild eyes. It's Dorothy he's got in mind. Uh, when uh, William Wordsworth is, is writing, he often does write about Dorothy, but often many of the women that appear come from this sort of tiny bundle of energy that was Dorothy Wordsworth. What I love about this book, and anyone who is interested in how, again, how women are erased from the record should read this. There is no doubt that her affection for her brother was enormous. I mean, it was the most important thing in her life. And Frances Wilson starts this, this biography uh, with the day at, at the beginning of October in 1802 when William Wordsworth returns from church with his bride. Now, Dorothy hasn't gone to the church and it precipitates a collapse in her that essentially means that she will not write again or pretty much even leave the house for the next 30 years. She will live a very, very long time. And all the way through, Frances Wilson picks out the things that Dorothy writes in her journals and says what was actually happening. And often she talks about the peace between it being just her and William at home in that period in Dove Cottage. But then Frances Wilson will say, well, actually, at that moment, Coleridge was living there. Coleridge's wife and family and children were living there. It was this most extraordinary salon, if you like, before salons really happened. And of course, the other thing that we forget often because the movies and television forget this, but Dorothy spoke with a very strong Cumbrian accent. And when you start to hear that in your head, when you read the beautiful descriptions of the countryside and of the changing of the seasons and of their garden, it's extraordinary. Everything that she's feeling, she writes about nature and if you like a kind of sentient nature. Um, she never writes any of her real feelings. We can only know what she's thinking because of what she doesn't say. And that, as I've been researching the life of my great grandmother, I have learned is terribly common. Uh, that for all the writing that many women did in the 19th century, this at the beginning and my great grandmother from the middle um, onwards, that it was very rare for women to actually write down their thoughts 
they put it all into the people that they were around them and the way that they were trying to bring them to life. So it's just one of those books that I came across because I was researching. I didn't need to read a biography of uh, Dorothy Wordsworth to write uh, my non-fiction book, but I fell into the arms of this book and it is one of those beautiful, tiny hidden jewels of a biography and anyone who is interested in romantic poetry and anyone who is interested in women's stories and how they go should absolutely read this. So, The Ballad of Dorothy Wordsworth by Frances Wilson. So my second non-fiction choice for May is a very different sort of memoir. Uh, it's autobiography rather than the kind of hybrid that we were just talking about. And it's just come out and it is called This Is Not A Pity Memoir by the extraordinary and mighty Abby Morgan. Now, most of you will know Abby Morgan as an Emmy winning and BAFTA winning screenwriter. She's just, you know, just for, most recently for The Split, but of course for Suffragette, for many, many films. And I'm not going to give all her credits because you will know. But this is the story of the human Abby Morgan, um, the Abby Morgan behind the enormously successful screenwriter. And it is one of the most heart-rending and heart-restoring books that I've read. It is the story of how her beloved partner, who is an actor and who had, uh, was suffering from health issues and was being treated uh, with a range of medication. That one day she simply went out and her mind was full of getting the children to school, having to go and pick up her partner's medication. She was going to have to ring her agent to say that the script that was due was not going to be ready. All of these things, a normal day, if you like. You know, we all have had those days where you're just going and everything, everything's going through your mind. And when she got home, she discovered her partner semi-conscious on the floor of the bathroom and in a very, very, very confused state and it wasn't clear what had happened. And Abby Morgan takes us through all of those early hours about how she reacted, what she did. She didn't know what to do. She couldn't remember whether it was 999 in this country or 911. Of course, someone who works in both countries and is writing in, in both um, cultural um, environments, if you like, these kind of stories. And of course, she was working on what was to become the split about lawyers. And in the end, she rings a friend and the friend says, you ring the ambulance now. And the helicopter is sent and her children are coming home from school and the ambulance comes and he's taken uh, to UCH Hospital in London. And that begins a nightmare which is going to last for not just the next 18 months in terms of health, but forever in a way, which is they don't know what's wrong. They try everything. He's clearly had some catastrophic brain uh, injury, but they don't know why or what's caused it. And they, little by little, they rule things out. And sometimes he can speak and sometimes he can't and his words are all jumbled, but it's not a stroke and it doesn't seem to be cancer. And she, in the end, they have to put him into an induced coma, uh, put, Peter, um, you know, put um, Jacob into an induced coma. And she takes us through the weeks and the months and the period of time uh, that finally they start to discover, that a particular doctor discovers that maybe the drugs that he was being given for his MS has caused this and discover that he is the 22nd person in the world to have had an incredibly averse uh, reaction to these drugs. But in a way, that's not even the heart of this extraordinary memoir. The heart of it is that when Jacob wakes up, he doesn't know who she is. He recognises other people, but he thinks that she is an imposter, that the real Abby Morgan has gone away, and that the person who's there at first is maybe just somebody sent by the state, by the hospital, to be nice to him. And even when they return home to their house with their children, with all the familiar things around, he still doesn't really think that she's her. Now, the book is, of course, full of the explanations and the medicine of this and the science of this and how they uh, come to cope with it. But what, for me, made this stand out was, well, I mean, it sounds obvious, She's an extraordinary writer, of course she is, we all know that. But I don't think I've read a memoir that is so honest about the true feelings that she had all the way through this, the frustration, the sense that she had failed, the sense that she was furious to be put into this position, the way that she wanted to hide it from people, and then 
the real kicker, which I didn't know. I've listened to a lot of Abby Morgan interviews uh, about her work, but also recently about this, this memoir. But that I didn't know in the middle of all of this and trying to cope with all of this, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I suppose all I can say to you is, if, if you want to know what courage looks like, read this. If you want to know what real love looks like, real, read this. If you want to know what it means to be a woman in the public eye, uh, working, doing extraordinary things, being fated at day and then going back at night to a life that is really tough, read this. It is truly exceptional and it deserves to win all the prizes. So that is Abby Morgan, This Is Not A Pity Memoir. Right, <laughs> my final choice, fiction. It's a bit sneaky because it's not come out yet. It comes out on the 15th of September. But you would be disappointed if there wasn't a crime novel. I know that because each time I've always snuck one in. Now this time I'm sneaking in something slightly different, which is this. This is the book Proof and it's simply called Marple, which, you know, <laughs> does what it says on the tin. And this is, and I'm one of the writers. So there are 12 uh, women who have been asked to write by the Agatha Christie estate a new Miss Marple story. And I have been, as you will know, from the very first Moss on a Monday when I did Sleeping Murder, uh, which was the last published Marple, uh, just before she died, although it was written much, much earlier. You will know that I am an enormous fan of Miss Marple. I think she is an unsung heroine of literature. I think she is subversive and tricksy and an exciting character. And she lives in the public imagination, partly through the television adaptations, of course, but partly because uh, Agatha Christie just knew how to write this exceptional older woman. And of course now, and I think I've made this joke before, when we first meet Miss Marple in, the, um, in short stories, um, she's presented as an old woman. Um, same age as me now, I realise. <laughs> and that's the difference about how we see, you know, 60 is the new 40, maybe we say. Anyway, um, the, the authors that have contributed are, I'm going to tell you them all, Naomi Alderman, Lee Bardugo, Alyssa Cole, Lucy Foley, Ellie Griffiths, Natalie Haynes, Ruth Ware, Dreda Say Mitchell, me, Karen McManus, Jean Kwok and the mighty Val McDermott. And we're all passionate about Marple and we were given a really tight brief that it could only be a Miss Marple within the time period that Agatha Christie wrote. So that meant that none of us could write Baby Jane or Little Jane. Uh, we were not allowed to give her a love interest. <laughs> um, so we weren't allowed to tell a story utterly unlike the one that Agatha Christie wanted to be told and quite right to, because I think that's really important if you're doing continuation, that you respect the author who created this character. We're just you know, stars going round the moon and the sun here. Um, and, uh, and also that we couldn't have her meet Poirot. <laughs> in other words, quite rightly, uh, that we respected who Jane Marple is. So out of that, it was the best excuse to reread all of the Jane Marple. There are 12 novels and there are various collections of short stories and go through it like a magpie, like a detective myself, to find little clues to stories that hadn't been written, that there might be um, something that was lurking in there that had suggested uh, a story that I could write for Miss Marple. And what I discovered was just joyous. You all know that I often write inspired by place. You know that, uh, many of you know that I live in Chichester. I'm a chai girl born and bred. Um, and my husband and I met at school here and we grew up here and we both are inspired uh, by this landscape of of Chichester and Fishbourne and Sussex. And when I was going through the novels, I discovered that once or twice, uh, Jane Marple had an uncle who was a canon in Chichester Cathedral. And so I thought, aha, that can be a bit of an inspiration. Um, and then I realized that maybe in a wonderful story where she meets uh, two very glamorous American girls at the Pensione in, in Florence, where she's sent, staying as a young girl, that comes back in a, a later novel, you know, that, that, that friendship is there. But I thought, well, of course, there would have been other girls in that school. So little by little, I just went through and made notes um, of things that I might use as the inspiration. And then, of course, I did what all novelists do. 
you just shut your eyes and think, okay, who is my Jade Marple? How can I make her a tribute to the Marple that we all love, but tell a really cracking good story that will get readers like me who love Marple just turning the pages faster and faster and faster. So I'm really pleased with the story that I've written, but there are some cracking other stories in here. And you know, when I give you a couple of the titles, I suppose you'll get them. So Lucy Foley's is called Evil in Small Places. Uh, Val McDermott's is called The Second Murder in the Vicarage, because you'll know the very first Marple was Murder in the Vic Vicarage. Uh, Murder at the Villa Rosa from Ellie Griffiths. And mine is called, I'll have to order the book to find out. That's it for me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the choices. Uh, I'll be back again in June, um, but I will be missing for July, August, um, because I will be writing a new novel. Um, you, you know, the non-fiction book will come out in October, but I've got to put my head down um, and get on with my new novel, which we'll be announcing very soon, um, and the title and all of these things. But, and it's very hard to be a good reader when you're trying to be a good writer. But for now, just remember, whatever you read, enjoy it, share the books, pass it on, and everything about what makes doing this fun is the lovely messages that you all send when a new uh, show, as I think of them, has gone out. So see you again at the end of June. But for now, this is me, Kate Moss, saying bye for now.